I'm so glad to have every one of you with us this morning. And it's really an honor to have John and Judy Groters with us this morning. They don't need any introduction, I don't think. Well, John's already led worship, so now you know John. Um, just an honor to know them and to count them as, as friends of ours. Uh, just a privilege to work with them. I couldn't say enough about them. John's going to come. He's going to take the morning service time. We'll take a break for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a regular Sunday school hour. And um, I told Gail if the kids want to stay in here, that's fine. Or if they want to go to Sunday school, I don't know. I'll leave it up to our Sunday school lady. Um, but uh, the adults are staying in here anyway because they're, they're preparing the meal downstairs. So uh, then after Sunday school, we'll go downstairs to eat. We'll come back for an afternoon service in lieu of the evening service. So while you're here, we'll go one stop shop. We'll get it all at once. And uh, then if you can stay after the dinner, then John's going to be back with us, still with us this afternoon. Uh, you don't want to miss anything he has to say. He is so full of information. He's such a blessing. Um, I just love working with John and Judy. They're amazing people. Um, John, actually, Judy's going to play a, a video, a brief video that introduces John. Then John's going to come speak to us. storyteller. I imagine that in any culture that's ever been, people sit around the campfire and there's a storyteller. By the time we get to our era, you can tell a story now with all of these tools, music, big screen. What is it about people that makes us want a good story? They recognize maybe someone in that story, or maybe they would like to be someone in that story, or maybe they're afraid of someone in that story. It can feel very personal because there's a connection. What if I walked a mile in their shoes? It is hard to make a movie, and it's really hard to make a good movie. It starts with an idea in your head, and then you scratch it down on paper, and you end up with a script. And then you start to assemble the pieces. You've got your cast that comes together, and then your sets begin to get designed, and your art direction comes into place, and then the lighting gets set, and then you walk onto the, the set for that day, and you look around, and you're there. Sometimes, despite however many times you've imagined it, it becomes vivid for the first time ever, right then and there. Part of it confirms the vision that you've always had, and then part of it expands the vision that you've always had. It's a pretty great privilege if you actually get to do everything from conceiving of a story and then writing a screenplay and then actually getting to make it into a movie. Because it is a beautiful thing when your film starts to assemble itself and you begin to uh, step into your own story in a, in a whole new way, as if for the first time. I guess we talk about a good story disguising itself because I don't want the audience to be aware of any of it. It's about giving them hints. It's about keeping them uh, suspended from their own sense of analysis that actually engages the imagination. I want to do communication that engages the listener so much that they want to hear the next thing. And the story is about the connection between the audience and the storyteller. It's like we're back at that campfire again. You and me experienced a story, lost in a story, together. So was, was I never saved? Seminary graduate, pastor, preacher. I got to thank you for the invitation, and, and Judy and I are thrilled to be here. And I first off want to say it's intimidating to come to a church that gets to hear Steve Smith teach every week. He's who I call for material. So pretty much this morning, you're probably going to hear a repeat of last week's sermon is probably what it's going to be. <laughs> what do I have to say to teach Steve Smith? But um, you really are privileged to have someone who is as deeply immersed, not just in the word in English, like maybe all of you are, but in, you know, Aramaic, Greek, Proto-Hebraic, I don't know, he speaks so many languages and has so many doctorate degrees. And so here I am, intimidated, um, but thankful. And, and he, you know, he didn't really do me any great favors. He said, we'd love to have you come, 
All right, well, what topic? Anything you want. You know how many things that includes? That didn't narrow it down for me at all. I kind of like it. Well, we're, we're teaching the Ten Commandments, and you're on number six. That kind of puts a, a reference point. But anything you want, I don't know. I just didn't. But what came to mind was, you know, it says, and this is where I start. It says in the Bible, I'm pretty sure it was 1 Peter 3.15, that you should be prepared to anyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that's in you. So someone asked, so I should be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in me. Which begs the question, is there hope in me? So today, in the three times we're going to have a chance to speak, I'm just going to make this real simple. The topic is why hope, and the first part, this is going to be this little part, is going to be me. <laughs> I'm going to give you my testimony, basically. But why hope? You're going to get to know John more than you want to. Second part is going to be why hope you? You'll find out if I have prophetic wisdom or not. But I'm going to talk about all y'all, which I'm part of. And then if we're able to still move after the potluck, it's going to be why hope them. So that's basically the outline. Now here's the reality. Today, this day, do you feel the darkness closing in? I do. Whether you're a young person like Scott or whether you're an old person like Steve. No, no offense. <laughs> no, let's be honest. We don't come to church and escape from the world. We come to church to engage with the world. And let's just say it. It's getting darker out there. I mean, we can't ignore that, that there's hundreds of thousands of refugees leaving Ukraine today. Pouring into Romania, in some cases, I talked to my Romanian friends yesterday morning, and they're scared in Romania. They remember the last time the bear took over. It was 50 years before they got rid of him. Oh, and that's just the Russia-Ukrainian border. Anybody notice the Olympics were on a couple weeks ago? How beautiful. The wall. I love the Olympics. But you know what's going on in the country where those Olympics were taking place? You know what? They're not showing on NBC's. They're not showing that Christian pastors are being arrested daily. Sentenced to nine years in prison, 12 years in prison. Churches are being bulldozed. They recently passed a new rule. No one under the age of 18 is allowed in the church service. Kind of looks like they passed that rule here too, actually. But um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're definitely under 18, and you guys. China is oppressing the church in a very systematic, organized way like we haven't seen in our lifetime. Or maybe you've heard of the little country known as North Korea. Where do you know that if you even say the word God, you will be thrown in a concentration camp? Do you know that if you even are caught laying your eyes on a Bible? Oh, I see a Bible. Right there, I just committed a crime against the God, Kim Jong. Which actually is an odd rule because it makes it difficult for the border guards. If we are smuggling Bibles into North Korea today, let's say we're going to do that. It'd be kind of dangerous, but fruitful. If at the border they open my backpack and the guard sees I've got 15 Bibles, the guard will go to prison for looking at the Bibles. <laughs> See the counterintuitive logic that uh, it's not working in their favor right there? It's dark in North Korea for Christians. It's dark in nor uh, northern Nigeria for Christians. You know that in northern Nigeria today that villages are just systematically being gunned down with automatic weapons from radical Islamists and the Fulani Muslims, do you know this is happening in our world? Do you know what it's like for Christians in Pakistan? Or let's talk about Iran. Now, at the same time, Iran is persecuting the church like you can't believe. Iran also, from what I've heard, is the fastest growing church in the world. And I'll tell you, the Christians in China, they're not Christians in name only, Sinos. If they're going to follow Jesus, man, they're going to follow Jesus. It's sort of like you mentioned this morning, Glenn. I mean, am I willing to give everything for this? Because that's the world we live in. And I'm not even talking about this culture, right? What happens in this culture if you speak up for not just for Christ, but for your belief in anything that the word says is true? Can you work in the university system? I don't know. I probably would have been fired a long time ago. I'm not wanting to take sides, but if you say the wrong thing in this culture, you're canceled, you're fired, you're marginalized, you're dismissed. 
This is the nation that was founded on the principles of the Bible? This is the nation on whose dollar bill says, in God we trust? What is happening? We're not going to meet in church and ignore the darkness that's going on in the world. I try to ignore it, to be honest with you. I stopped listening to the news. I listened to classical music in my car. I just want some peace. I don't want to be ignorant, but I don't want to be constantly bombarded with a news media that I don't trust, which you can add to a government that I don't trust, a medical community I don't trust, some of the church I don't trust. It's terrible. Who are we going to turn to but each other in this day and age? So the question I'm asking myself, is there any hope in me? Do I have any hope? It's a good question, not to prepare a message on and and teach, but just just reflect, just ask yourselves. Be honest with yourselves. When you close your eyes at night, when your head hits the pillow, are you hopeful or are you hopeless? John, what's the truth? I'm sitting at my table. I have hope. I really do. Maybe you could say, well, you're an optimist on the personality scale. Yeah, maybe. My wife is an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I get energy from people. She gets energy from space. You know, there's different kind of personalities. I don't want to make this a blanket statement. But here's the question. You know how people say, somebody said, I don't know, maybe, by the time, by the time you're about 50, you have the face that you've earned. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> that music was too loud. That preacher goes too long. He's a heretic. Amen. You are dismissed. I feel that way, by the way, every Sunday. I was asking myself, but but some people have a joyful countenance. And and, and in Christ, right, joy is one of the side effects. That's not maybe if you happen to have the right personality. Joy is our middle name. So I kind of put it like this, you know. If you have the face that you've earned by the time you're 50, what about your heart? Does your heart have smile lines on it or frown lines? So ask yourself that question. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just saying let's be reflective. And as the world gets darker, if you have smile lines on your heart, it's probably not anymore because of the things that you used to think the world had to give you. Right? Like, if you really have this joyful, optimistic, future oriented perspective, it'd be unlikely it came from the places that I used to think gave us that kind of courage and encouragement. So, since that verse is in 1 Peter, right? 1 Peter 3.15, I'll read it to you, and it's 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's kind of strange. How can you sanctify the Lord? He sanctifies us. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. All right, so if I did this little self-analysis and I started to say, okay, Peter, who are you and who are you talking to? Now I'm wading dangerously into Steve's territory here, but I'll, I'll give you what I know. If I mess up, please just... I don't want to give any falseness. But Peter, Simon, is called by Jesus, right, with his brother, Andrew, little town of Bethsaida. I've been to Bethsaida. I'm sure Steve's been to Bethsaida. It's just a little, little nothing town. It's on the north coast of the Sea of Galilee. You go there today, it's been excavated. They'll, they'll even tell you they think they know where Peter's mom's house is. Who knows? I can't tell. But, but so Peter's from a little fishing village, and he's fishing with Andrew, his brother. And he's married. He's young. Now, there's a picture back in your uh, sanctuary I noticed last night painted by a little known painter named Rembrandt that's his first name by the way Von Inns is his last Rembrandt painted a picture of Jesus in the boat storm on the sea of Galilee and there's Jesus asleep and there's the disciples gray beard old men I don't think Rembrandt got that right I think when Jesus calls Talmudim he doesn't go around and, and pull them out of the senior citizen center he takes the kids That's what Talmudim were. And it's an interesting thing that the Son of God chose to come when and where he came. It's a great line in Jesus Christ Superstar. Why did he choose such a backwards place in such a strange time? But he comes to Galilee in the first century. 
I can't tell you why, but one of the things that's unique about that is Galilee in the first century was the place in all history and in all the world that was most devoted to this rabbi Talmudim, rabbi discipleship relationship. So that's a little different than going to school. That's a little different than going to synagogue. A rabbi, like the famous rabbis Hillel, Shammai, those guys would, would look for the best and brightest students and they would give them a call. You can come and follow me and you can come and follow me and you can come. And the, the, the Talmudim then leave their world of whatever it was and they become the disciples, the Talmud of that rabbi which is a full-on immersion program. It's not just a classroom situation where you're going to learn only from the rabbi. That's part of it. But the deeper connotation is you're going to learn to walk as the rabbi walks. And they say that all the time in Hebrew. It's the walk. And what's the walk? Well, the walk is the way you live your life in its entirety. So this rabbi doesn't work from 9 to 5, Monday through Thursday, take Friday off, and then preach a sermon on Sunday, and then go home. This rabbi is being watched 24-7 in everything he does. His entire conduct is, is visible to these Talmud. Peter, Andrew are called from Bethsaida to follow Rabbi Jesus. And the rest of the disciples are called. They're young. They're young. They're probably 13, 14, 15. Maybe Peter a little bit older because he's married, but they married young. Maybe possibly Matthew a little bit older because he'd been a tax collector. But now they're going to write their Gospels, right, in the 60s or later in the 70s. So if they're already 50 years old or so by the time Jesus calls them, they're pretty old for that culture. But think of them as young people. So I say all that to say, who's the Peter we, we kind of talk about in church a lot? We talk about Peter in a lot of ways to me like he's a young King David. He's tempestuous. He's fiery. He's probably athletic. He's all in or he's all out, right? I mean, we like Peter because he's got passion. And he seems like he's a natural-born leader. It reminds me a lot of David. And when he makes a mistake, boy, he makes a doozy, sort of like David. I mean, Peter is the one who, who when they say, well, who do you, you know, they say, people are saying that you're Elijah. People are saying you're John the Baptist. People are saying this and that. And Jesus says, well, who do you guys say that I am? It's Peter who raises his hand. You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. And Jesus says, flesh and bone did not reveal that to you, did he? You didn't learn that from man. You learned that from the Father. Peter spoke up, and you know what? You know, he was right. And then shortly after that, he sees Jesus on the storm of the sea walking, and Peter, he jumps out of the boat. If it's good enough for you, and he starts walking. And then he looks down, and he starts sinking. <laughs> that's Peter. He's either walking on water or he's sinking fast. But the thing is, that's the young Peter, right? That's the Peter of the Gospels. You know, we don't stay the same, do we, our whole lives? You can't define us only by what we were like when we were 14, thank God, or 18. And now, we're going to read this epistle of Peter, written in around 62 or so A.D. Peter's in Rome. He calls it Babylon, figuratively speaking, as the place apart from God, Babel. Rome is the new Babel. And Peter writes this letter and he says, uh, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. So he's writing this to a group of Christians in what's today modern Turkey, right? It was called Asia Minor. I've been to all these places, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Why are they dispersed? Well, they're they're kind of like Ukrainians right now who know the Russians might come and get them. Or even worse, even worse, they're like Christians in modern day, today day, Afghanistan. You know what is happening to Christians in Afghanistan? Now, I'm going to tell you. I want you, I want you to know that I'm not talking about this like I'm a big scholar. I'm just, the work that we do puts us in contact with amazing organizations. So we work, I'll talk about more of this later, but we work with groups like the Voice of the Martyrs. So we hear firsthand reports. I'm on the board of a group called World Mission. World Mission is reaching the unreached people around the world with the gospel. That's what they're doing in their, in their heart languages. Beautiful organization. Um, what's happening in Afghanistan right now is that the Taliban are totally in control. And everything you've heard that's bad is happening, it's worse. 
The little bit of media coverage that comes from Kabul, the Taliban kind of modifies their behavior a bit in Kabul just to keep the pressure off. But once you get out of that city, there's no journalists. And if there are journalists, they get gunned down and murdered. And I'm sorry to tell you, my friends, they are systematically, genocidally executing Christians in cruel and inhuman ways. All Christians. It's bad. And... I get so disgusted with this, I can hardly speak. We left $80 billion worth of weapons to put in the hands of the Taliban, including our biometric rec re records and resources. Our biometric records and resources mean, even if you were to say, let's just throw our Bible away, and, 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 and if they come and ask, they've got records of you because we kept them. So they know, oh no, you, you two have, uh, we can see that you listened to a sermon once on your phone, off with their heads. Oh, we see that you two once had a Bible app on your phone. We'll gouge your eyes out and we'll skin you alive. They're killing people. Now, I'm not telling you that because I heard it on TV. I'm telling you that because I heard it from the man who is in charge of getting Christians out of Afghanistan. One man. I'm going to call him John. We interviewed him in our studios. We had to black out his face. He would be in moral danger if he was found. Just a few weeks ago, we sent one of our team members, Hajin, who works for us, on a, on, a, on a film trip to the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. He saw this stuff firsthand. And I'm going to tell you more about what he saw in terms of the miracles of the Lord and how many people came to Christ on this trip. But all that is to say, the Christians in the dispersia who are in places like Cappadocia and Galatia, well, you don't go to Cappadocia for the scenery. You don't go to Cappadocia for the restaurants. Have any of you ever been to Cappadocia in eastern Turkey? Have you ever been there, Steve? You go to Cappadocia to hide. Why? Because the rock there is what's called tofu rock. It's soft. You can carve it with a spoon. The mountains are filled with caves and places. I can show you a couple pictures of Cappadocia. These, this is a, an artist's rendering. But they built cities underground. We visited one called Darren Kuyu. It goes 19 stories down. I got horribly claustrophobic the first time. I'm walking down this stairway. It's getting narrow and narrow, narrower. The air is getting hot. There was a big line in front of me that I couldn't pass. And I, I'm getting, I don't like the cave thing, really. I look behind me. There's 150 Japanese tourists. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I don't like this. I'm carrying this bag. I snuck off into a little crevasse. And Judy who was behind me, saved me, of course, again. And she, I said, Judy, can, I can't breathe. Can you carry my heavy bag? So, of course, she carried it down. She was fine. <laughs> Not proud of myself. <laughs> but Darren Kuyu was an example of why you go to Cappadocia. You go to Cappadocia to hide. Because people are going to come, and, and better to hide. So what Hajin filmed, my guy, two, well, how was it, a month ago now, in the, on the border of Pakistan was a bunch of refugees from, Afghan from Afghanistan hiding. Now, they're not 19 stories underground, and we can't tell people where they are, but they're basically an unfinished concrete block. There's a lot of unfinished buildings you'll find as you drive through Turkey and Pakistan. They start a project, and then they abandon it. So sitting on the floor, 70 to 80 people in a room, not allowed to go outside, there sits the Christians, who, by the way, had to escape in the middle of the moonless night. Why? Because the Taliban has the drones that we left them. So they fly drones over the border looking for these escaping Christians. Did I mention I'm disgusted by this? Well, the Lord is still at work, and some of them are getting out, and they're, they're finding these little, you call them, call them camps. They're not really camps like there's a fence and a swimming pool. They're just a, a concrete building that society doesn't really pay attention to. And there are dozens of these camps today. And there are these Christians. They don't know what the next step is. They don't know. I kind of picture... I kind of picture the people who are receiving Peter's epistle as those people. Now, what would you write? If we handed out paper today or we all got on our iPads and I said, hey, here's the addresses of our brothers and sisters in any of these countries that I just mentioned where they're suffering, what would we write to them? Condolences? Probably. That's where we'd start. That's where my heart starts is condolences. Interesting, isn't it, that Peter writes about hope. Listen to this, how he starts the letter. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again, born us again. We are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefilable, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You're 19 stories underground. And he just said, you have a living hope. And he gives you this picture of glory to hang on to. Why hope? Well, all right. Let me get into the autobiographical part. I um, was at a conference last summer in Windsor, Colorado. It was called the Cambridge 80. I got invited by a man I really respect, his name is Eric Ludi. Eric has authored dozens of books, he's a great speaker, he's a man who's got the joy of the Lord on his face all the time. He was a huge fan of my movie, which of course made me respect him all the more, one of our movies. But I love Eric, and, and uh, I met him when he came up to me, I was at a booth at a Christian conference, and we, were, we had just released the movie Tortured for Christ, and, and Eric came up to me and he said, I need to thank you, uh, well, I've never met you for what? He says, well, my 13-year-old son, Hunt, Hunter, who doesn't like Christian movies or Christian books or Christian music or really anything Christian, and saw your movie, and it's his favorite movie he's ever seen. So he thanked me as a father. Now, I can say, you're welcome. Let's thank Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, who lived it out. What, what impressed your son wasn't the filmmaking. It was the life of people who learned how to, at the highest level, serve Christ. But Eric invited me to this conference. I had no idea, none, what it was about. But I said, yeah, okay, I'll come. You're only inviting 80 people. It seems like kind of an honorable thing. So I get to this conference. There's no agenda. There's no main speaker. They're not trying to teach us. They wanted to gather men from around the country to, to spend three days just praying, seeking the face of God, getting to know each other. It was really cool. And so in a lot of creative ways, man, we just prayed together, like all at the same time and guided prayers. They sat us in tables of eight people, and they had exercises for us to do. So the eight would do stuff. So it, was just, it was fun and fast and fluid, and I met some amazing people. And at that table, that eight-person table, one of the first things they had us do to kind of mix her, I guess, get to know each other, was answer some questions. And... One of the questions was, what is your superpower, and what is your kryptonite? Now, I already know Scott here, his parents, or his sister and his dad have the superpower of being invisible, because they were sitting there this morning, that was pretty cool, now I can see you, I don't know how you, but what is your superpower, and what is your kryptonite? Okay, it's kind of a fun question, and whatever, I mean... I'm sick of all the superhero Marvel movies, but I'll, I'll play along. What's a superhero got? Well, they've got some kind of crazy thing that they didn't necessarily earn. It just happened to them. They're some kind of a, you know, genetic or spider bite or whatever it is that kind of gives them an advantage over, over all the other people in the realm of their universe, right? That's a superpower. They didn't get it through hard work. They didn't get it through training like an athlete. They just can fly or shoot a web out of their wrist or who knows what crazy thing we can do to give you an advantage over everybody else. So what do I have, I ask myself, that would give me an advantage over the other people in my realm, something I didn't earn or deserve? Came to me right away. I have a loving dad. You know how rare that is in this world? To have a father that you respect, who stuck around, who stayed true to my mom? I have a loving dad. If you look at prisons and you look at the men in prisons, you talk to anybody that does prison ministry and they'll give you incredible statistics about the numbers of men in prison who are fatherless. You know, the Bible word for that is orphan, by the way. So uh, my dad, see you got a photo of me and dad when we were little? All right. Okay, I'm the little one there. I was shaving at age four. I had very mature. So that's my dad, Larry Groders, back in the 60s, and then there's my dad on the left sometime now. Larry, a uh, tall, handsome guy, was a great athlete, very humble, and surprised, he, met, he started dating my mom, that my mom and dad were raised and born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They met in high school, and uh, they were together, um, 
And then my dad graduated from Hope College, and he decided he felt the call of the Lord. It kind of came out of the blue. He hadn't been planning on this, but he felt the call of the Lord to go into ministry. And so he entered the seminary right about the same time they got married, 1961, and he became a pastor. I was born in 62, so I grew up in a pastor's house with a dad who played ball with me and played basketball with me and, and, and was just a great, great guy. That's a, that's a superhero kind of thing for me. And it wasn't just I had this sort of fatherly relationship that I'm glad, but he also modeled, not just kind of lectured, but modeled like a rabbi how to walk the walk, right? I mean, my dad walked the walk. And in his churches, we were in Arizona. My growing up years, we spent about 12 years in Scottsdale, Arizona, at a big church out there. And then my dad took a little church in northern Michigan, a little town called Charlevoix, when I was a high school freshman. And we moved the family to, from the desert to the north. And I just, I just loved the north, and I just loved the little town in, the, in Lake Michigan, the coast, and the seasons. And I, st I still do. I never complain about the cold because I grew up in heat. But that was my... Growing up. And my dad, he, he would get asked to speak at youth conferences, youth conventions. This is in the 70s. And he would always take me. I mean, I'm eight years old, and I got to stand up there with my little guitar. And back in those days, the high school kids could play Young Life songs on the acoustic guitars, and that was how the singing time went. And so we're, we're banging away for those tears I died and pass it on. And there's four or five high school kids. And there's little eight-year-old me getting to play, getting to be a part of this, which meant I also got to hear the speakers at all these camps. And I'll be sitting on the ground. And uh, it started to kind of dawn on me in those young years. I couldn't remember what everybody said. I, as good of a preacher as Steve is, it's tough to remember what he talked about last week, much less six weeks ago, right? It's tough. But we know we were, we were blessed by it. We know that truth was bouncing off of these walls. and this, We know that we were in the presence of something that we thought was real and solid. I remember that, that the teachers at youth camp, whatever they were selling, I wanted to buy it. And I'm glad I was there. And then for me, it was not nothing really very dramatic, but I do remember I was 12 years old. I was at a little camp in the desert, an ugly one called Wachuca Oaks, and I'm lying in that bunk bed made out of wrought iron and going to bed, just praying to the Lord. You know, I've been around you my whole life, but I want to make sure that you're, you're completely, you know, I'm completely in. So whatever it means to just invite. So that, that kind of step happened because of the modeling. I was raised in it, right? I never had a big atheistic time. So that was my childhood. It was pretty good. I was the oldest of three kids. Then I'm going to advance you. I told you this is just a big old long story about me, so I apologize. This feels like home slideshow. Um, so then uh, advance me to college, and there's, there's my wedding day. I'm the young guy on the left. <laughs> <laughs> now, my wife, Judy, is amazing. She actually made that dress. She actually made those clothes. She made everything. Our, our, our wedding was kind of a dollar general uh, budget, but it was great. We were on, on a, uh, got married in the chapel at Camp Geneva on the shores of Lake Michigan in 1987. So we've been married 34 years. So we have really walked a walk together, as a lot of you have. We just saw, I guess on your anniversary here, you have to give money. Is that what they did? They come up and they have to give money with, <laughs> on your birthday or your anniversary? That is manipulative. Man, you guys are clever. <laughs> bad enough we have a birthday now we have to give money <laughs> so marriage I'm gonna I hope I can be forgiven for saying this but my wife is my partner and we realize as the decades have gone on two things one our relationships getting better every decade it's gotten better um, I'm growing up a little bit she was pretty mature the whole way but I'm growing up a little bit um, we also realize that God put together a whole bunch of qualities that we had no idea were qualities when we met. I mean, none. The, the work that we do together now and the way God has put us together, it baffles both of us, the complementary gifts. We, we don't, I'll get into that in a minute. But the dangerous thing I want to say is, you know what my kryptonite is? You know what the thing is that if you bring kryptonite into Superman's presence, what happens to Superman? He can't fly, right? He's got this superpower unless kryptonite. So... I know it's kind of silly, but, but the superpower which allows you to have the security of a father who kind of gave you the truth and modeled it for you lets you do things like get asked to come and, and share your heart with people. But you know what can diminish that, in fact kill it, is if I am in disharmony with my wife. If I am in disharmony, then if the Bible says your prayers will be hindered. Now, it 
I don't know if this is true for all, uh, others of you who are married in here, or maybe you've never had disharmony. If you've, if, you, if you've never had disharmony in your marriage, I would like to carve you into a mountain somewhere because you're a god. But disharmony in your marriage will diminish your prayer life and any effectiveness you might have for the kingdom. At least that's what I have found. And I'm sorry to say we haven't always followed the biblical principle that says don't let the sun go down on your anger. Sometimes we just play around. And, and sometimes I'd rather, you know, there's a question, would you rather be right or close? <laughs> sometimes I've learned in my own heart I'd rather win an argument and lose a relationship. You ever feel like that? It's so important to be right. Now, I'm trying to work on that, and Judy obviously has let me work patiently through it with her. But my marriage, which is the best thing that ever happened to me, if mishandled, can be kryptonite. So we had a couple kids. Got a picture of our kids, Jude. So we have a daughter named Jordan, a son named Jed. This is back when they lived with us. They're both married now. They both have families of their own. I don't know, do I have any pictures of the grandkids or anything? Um, oh, that's my latest grandkid. That's Eleanor. I'm teaching her to drive. <laughs> what? She's advanced for her age. <laughs> See, her eyes are right on the road. She's driving. She's like <laughs> one and a half. Um, both of my kids have three natural born kids. They each have families of three. And then our daughter, who's the mother, has like five refugee foster kids. So if you get our whole group together, we're like, we are the world. They're, we got, and that's not even that. We got kids from China, Thailand, Africa, all over the world. Our, our family's now a big, happy mess. That was in Colorado this summer. We took all these kids to Colorado for Thanksgiving, and the little one sleeping over there on the right, and the little girl Nora trying to get out of the grass. Goes. Anyway, so this is our family. And, you know, I'll just tell you, if you're going to know why I have hope in me, my kids love the Lord. They both serve him with passion. Jordan and her husband, Zach, man, they are amazing missionaries. They, they, were, gonna be, they were in Brazil. They were feeling they wanted to be missionaries in Africa. God called them to be farmers in Allegan, Michigan. Strangest call you'd ever heard. Neither of them had ever grown a flower. We, they were the most suburban kids called to be farmers. Maybe some of you are farmers. They had to start from scratch. Like, this is ground. <laughs> this is a barn. Now they got not as many as Job, Glenn, but they got cattle and sheep and pigs and they grow hay and they're turning that farm into a mission. In fact, today they're in California kind of finalizing the deal where their farm now will still be farming but will also be a recidivism project for men coming out of some kinds of incarceration or problems where ministry is happening and the farm is growing and the men are put to work. They're also church planners. They also have a little rural church, not totally dissimilar from this one. Uh, they're generous to a fault. My daughter, I, I'm so thankful, and I have such hope because they married well. My son, Jedediah, he's a pastor in Colorado Springs. He pastors uh, at a wonderful church called Springs Community Church, and he does the music there, the small groups there. He preaches once a month. And there's my dad and my, my son. So it's three generations of preachers except for me in the middle who isn't one, <laughs> except today. <laughs> but um, why do I have hope in me? Well, that would be a reason. When you see God's blessing on your family and you see that kind of healthiness, boy, that ought to put some hope, and it does in me. It really does. 20 years ago, Judy and I started a business. Now, I had worked for a church denomination for years and traveled the world doing sort of mission films, that kind of thing. But we started Groder's Productions in, in 2001, September 1 of 2001. That's just the front door of our building. And we thought, let's just give it a go, and let's just see what would happen if we started a little media company. And we had no money, but, but I, I started with two employees and a rented office space, so there were four of us. And, and I took Judy out of a very, <laughs> she was doing great as a consultant for some fancy computer software that I can't even understand, and she was making a lot of, anyway, she, she agreed to help me. So we went shoulder to shoulder, and it's consumed us since our kids have moved out. <laughs> The business has kind of become the new child and the projects that we work on. Judy kind of is the chief operating officer. She does all the hard stuff, the business world, the contracts. She runs the app and the web development team. She's also the producer on all the films. I'm the director, the writer, the director, editor. She's the producer. Sometime I can teach you the difference of those things. But they're completely different jobs, and they're meant to be at odds with each other, <laughs> right? A director is supposed to have a limitless imagination. I 
don't know if it's limitless, but it's usually out of bounds, my imagination. A producer is supposed to bring a project in on budget and on time. So I want this, and the producer, so that's a natural tension, and it can be an uh, unhealthy tension sometimes. But in our case, it's really a cool thing, because she's not going to say no to me to play a power play or just show, to prove that she can, and I'm not going to ask. So we work together, and God has given her a completely different set of giftings than mine. She doesn't want to do my job. I could not do her job. And our business is 20 years alive and thriving because of this marriage that had no idea that we were putting together a business relationship. And a business relationship is often not the most romantic of things. I don't necessarily advise it for everybody, but um, through its ups and downs, man, I look now and I see, we started this business and we wrote down a mission statement. We weren't starting a ministry. We weren't gonna ask anybody for donations. Why did we start Groders? So we did a mission statement to reveal the beauty of Christ to the world through excellent media. Okay, we did that. You were supposed to write mission statements back in those days. Well, interestingly enough, now that I can look back, that's exactly what God has let us do for the last 20 years. We have been able to reveal, we haven't went out there pounding or beating or, you know, in any kind of way shoving, but just reveal the beauty of Christ, which is kind of a code word for entertainment. It ought to be something attractive to the not just to the church, not just to our community, not even just to the USA, but to the world. And then through media with this word excellent, which was maybe a little bit presumptive 20 years ago, but um, it's been our goal all along. And it was our, our commitment. So as a business, <laughs> what God has taught me has been ridiculously cool. We've done 80 episodes with a guy named Ray Vanderlaan. Maybe some of you might have heard of a series called That the World May Know. With Ray, we have traveled into almost every square inch of the biblical lands, from the Sinai deserts through Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Rome, Italy. We've been everywhere doing these half-hour episodes with him where he brings a group of people. They're like history channel things where he's marching around, and we've got maps and graphics and recreations and sound design and music and all the best. Um, and, oh, yeah, so there's, there's just some other pictures. We've, we, I've, I've learned the Bible from Ray in the Judaic Hebrew context. Well, that was helpful. Uh, another project that we had, I just want to give you a little bit of my, my history. We got a call in 2006 from a group I'd never worked with called Answers in Genesis. They were building a thing called the Creation Museum down south of Cincinnati. And they called and, and they said, you know, you guys are a production company. Somebody recommended you to us. Would you be interested? We have a bunch of media needs. We're gonna, so we went down there and we met with them. We ended up producing 50 films for the opening of the Creation Museum. Some that were huge, big, three-screen, interactive, you know, water squirts on your face and the chairs shake, really fun. Some that were scientific kiosks. And I remember when I went down there, um, I really didn't have any education at all about this concept of creationism. I kind of figured, I, I don't know, wasn't there, I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm fine with all that. It's just how, where I was. But in the process of that job, I got to interview about 20 or 25 of, of the world's leading scientists in their areas of speciality. And let me tell you, if it's intimidating to preach in Steve Smith's church, it's really intimidating to have to sit down and conduct an intelligent interview with some of these geeky geniuses who you don't know anything about. I mean, I didn't hardly know what to say, but just get them talking. I'll give you one example. A guy named Dr. Emil uh, Silvestru was the world's leading karstologist. All right, here's a test. Who knows what a karstologist studies? Anyone? Oh, I'm glad I wasn't the only one. Caves. Karstology's case. Steve knew it. He just wanted to make you feel bad. Um, Emil was a professor at some University of Paris at Sorbonne. He, you know, he was a world leader. And, and if you've ever been to any caves, I mean, they always give you the date. This cave is so many millions year, of years old. These stalactites or stalagmites, I forget, one's falling. But they take hundreds of thousands or half, half a million years to form and half a million years for this and a million years for that. And how would any of us ever question? I mean, we're not karstologists, so whatever they tell me, oh, it took you know, 10 million years for Carlsbad Caverns to form. And then Emil, in his interview, says, I always loved that theory. The problem is when the facts get in the way of a beautiful theory, and now we had the stalactites growing on the handrails. <laughs> Them some old handrails. 
forced him to rethink his paradigm. There was a woman named Mary Schweitzer from the University of North Carolina. She was a paleontologist. Who knows what paleontologists study? Man, am I glad I'm here. I don't know either. Anyway, she was digging up dinosaur bones up in Montana. And they had found dinosaur bone digs are valuable. You can sell that. I mean, it's valuable work. And it's the payoff. I mean, no one pays. So she's on a dig. University. She's not a Christian. Secular, evolution, all the way. And they are trying to extract... A, a T-Rex, pretty cool, found in, I believe it was Montana, I'm pretty sure. And they were using a helicopter to kind of give an even lift for some reason. And as they're lifting the, the biggest leg bone, the femur, I guess you'd call it, out of this T-Rex, it broke. Oh, what a shame. And Mary Schweitzer goes over, starts taking pictures. Now, I was taught from every authority of my life that the dinosaurs went extinct 70 million years ago, right? 70 million years ago. I don't really know how long that is, but it's a long time ago. 70 million years. Makes me feel young. <laughs> Inside the bone, you know what they found? Hemoglobin, red blood cells, stretchy soft tissue. You know what the scientific community did with this find? Ignored it said, oh, we guess fossilization must take a lot longer than we thought. <laughs> I can show you cowboy hats that are fossilized. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, maybe that was an anomaly. They've, they've now broken dozens and dozens of other dinosaur bones to, 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 to discover whether this was an, it's, it's true in every case. You can draw your own conclusion. I personally do not believe anymore that it's been 70 million years, or I think that that stretchy stuff would be fossilized. I think that hemoglobin would be gone. That's the kind of thing that I got the privilege of discovering, and I could go on and on about. We could speak about this for a month. I got a lot of books in my library. I don't lecture on the topic. I just, what did it do for me as far as the hope that is in me? What if the flood wasn't a metaphor? What if the flood was a real event, like it's described in the Bible? Well, we're in First Peter, right? So maybe, maybe it was a myth. Maybe it was a way of Moses you know, describing some kind of localized flood or making sense out of a rainy day. But here's Peter. We're in his book. I'm right now in chapter 3, and he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, not just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight, souls were saved through water. Does that sound to you specific or general? I mean, come on. Come on. Eight souls is exactly the number of souls that we read about in Genesis who were on the ark. Eight. Did you know that there are 200 and some, 20 or 30, I can't remember. I saw this in Hong Kong in a, oddly, an art museum. There's 230 people groups that are scattered all over the world, from the southern tips of South Africa to the northern mountains of China, who have in their own legends, their own oral traditions, 240 different countries, language groups, they have stories of a family being preserved in a global flood on a boat. Now let's just unpack that logically for one second. How would that possibly be true? Oh, I have an idea. There was a global flood. <laughs> Wiped out everybody but eight people. When they repopulated the earth in the plains of Shinar, people multiplied. All those people knew the stories of the flood. In fact, they're probably living with a shrine to the boat. Who knows what it was like in Babel back in those days. But we also know, as mankind has want to do and had just done, which is why God destroyed the whole earth in the flood, they drifted away from God again, like we always do, and they disobeyed him. And God scattered them, right? He's, he confused their languages, and he scattered them across the earth. This is what the Bible says. We can talk about how the continents were separated. We can talk about a lot of things. 
But guess what they took when they were scattered? They took their memories. And their memories included a global flood with a boat, and eight people survived it. So you can find in languages that I can't even pronounce that story. Not only that, you can see evidences of the, of the flood. I grew up in Arizona, like I said. You go to the Grand Canyon, they tell you the, the, the Colorado River, by millions and millions of years, carved through the rock layers of the Grand Canyon, and for some reason it carved, you know, 500 feet straight down, and that's how we have the beautiful Grand Canyon. Well, that makes no sense. It makes no sense. One of the reasons it makes no sense is because if it were carving down slowly, and it were going through sedimentary layers, then the layers would always be straight, and if there were an earthquake at some time, those hard layers would crack. But if you go to the Grand Canyon, you look at some spots, the, the, all the sedimentary layers, at some points, they curve together. I don't need to say anything else. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a geologist, but God gave us a rational brain, right? Why is there hope in me? All right, here's the point I'm getting to. I want to remember the story where Jesus says, a wise man builds his house on the rock, and a foolish man builds his house on the sand. And when the floods come, the house in the sand is destroyed, is washed away and destroyed. You know that story, right? Now, I could read it, but I think you, you know the story. Steve, you're a builder. Is sand a bad material to build a house on? Yeah. No, come on. <laughs> My house is built on sand. In Michigan, we love to build on sand. I mean, we, it's hard, but it drains. Like, we, drains. all the houses in my area, West Michigan, it's basically, a, it's not a rocky, it's a sandy foundation. But this sand, as I learned from Ray Vanderlaan, has a different context. Now, here's what I wanted to say, and then I'm going to explain all this why. There are things in Israel called the wadis. You've been in wadis. They're dry, and they're kind of, they look like riverbeds, basically. And you can walk down them, and it's smoother, and... A lot of times they're surrounded by kind of a little bit of rock. And it would be a great place to build your house. You wouldn't have to climb up with the materials. It's flat. It's nice and peaceful, quiet. Except guess what happens in wadis every once in a while? Massive flash floods. They're really dangerous. They say if you hear the sound, you've got about 20 seconds to get out of there or you will die. Judy went on the internet last night, just found an example. This is a wadi. Just this year. That comes out of nowhere. If you build your house on that flood path, what's going to happen to your house? So here's the thing. Okay, thanks, Judy. The wise man builds his house on the rock. The foolish man builds his house on the sand, which means when the floods of life come, that house is going to get washed away. So your faith and my faith, is it built on rock or is it built on sand, right? Now, when I was 12 and sitting on the floor of those campfire southern meetings in, in the mountains of Flagstaff or wherever, I mean, I believe truth was seeping into me. I believe the Holy Spirit was at work. I also believe that it's possible to be kind of emotional and, and to sort of say, I, I, yeah, I mean, if it's choice is hell or accepting Jesus, I'm in for the Jesus thing, right? Okay, nothing wrong with, I mean, any way the Lord works, fine. But if it's an emotional-based commitment to Christ, if it's just your emotion, which in, in, in certain moments is powerful and good, I'm not against emotion. But what happens when your emotion changes? Because it will. Your emotion will change. Let me just talk about marriage, for example. We work with a guy named Dr. Gary Chapman. Have any of you ever heard of the five love languages? Okay, a lot of you have heard of it. It's been a best-selling book since the 90s. It's crazy. It keeps selling more and more. And he's written a bunch of other five love languages for kids and for military and for parents with you know, dementia. There's a lot of things where the concept is if you learn to give love in the way the other person most appreciates it, you kind of get somewhere. But if you just do what you like to do, you, you find, why isn't, she ex why isn't she excited that I did this? Well, it turns out your love language. It's been a simple concept. Gary Chapman's a great, wonderful, sincere dude. He's, he's 84. We just filmed him. We just did a master class with him. He's got all the energy and passion he's ever had. He's really a genuine article, and uh, I really love him and respect him. And he says, you know how long the tingles last? 
when you, when I, you know, I don't, again, I feel like, I'm, but when I first saw Judy, she was playing on the Hope College volleyball team, and she was kind of a star athlete. She was spiking the ball in people's faces. She was a freshman starting on the volleyball team, and she'd been a state champion in high school. I wandered through the gym pretty much randomly one day, and there was a college volleyball game going on with pretty girls, so I sat down and cheered for the pretty girls. And Judy shamelessly flirted with me that whole game. I mean, just kind of that whole come hither. You know, I could tell. Now, she says she didn't even know I was there, but a guy can tell when that girl is putting out the vibe, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Happened to me all the time. So out of some form of pity, I asked her out, and, you know, and it, it, went, it went, went, went from there. But, man, I had, I had this feeling, even before I knew her name, even before I knew anything about her, I already had this some sense, some spidey sense, you know, that, man, I, I got to get to know this girl. That's the tingles, okay? It's fun. There's a billion songs written about it. Every Hallmark movie ever made is really, that's about as deep as it goes. I guess I don't know that. I don't watch them. So I shouldn't disparage Hallmark movies. I might make one someday. But what Gary Chapman says is that feeling lasts two years. Have any of you been married longer than two years? A lot of you guys have. We better learn how to build a relationship on something other than just emotion. Now that's going to be true, for me anyway, also with this commitment to this God I've never seen, to a Messiah who lived two millennia ago in Syria. If I'm going to really devote my life to that person, I don't think emotion is going to cut it. And so I, wanted to, I still want to build my faith on rock, not sand. Does that make sense? If my faith is still built on sand, what's going to happen when one of my kids gets in that car accident that I know Steve has had to live through? What's going to happen when the diagnosis comes from me that I know some of you have gone through? Because it's going to happen. I mean, we know it's going to happen. I want my faith to stand on rock until my last breath, and at which point I want to be more excited than I really don't remember my first breath. So for me, I don't know that this is necessarily mature, but here's how that process has worked for me so far. I read, I think it was in about the seventh grade, however old you are then, I think I was about that age, when I read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. My dad used to talk about C.S. Lewis a lot. He respected him a lot. So one day I got this little book, Mere Christianity. Uh, that book was a, a series of radio programs that, that Lewis had delivered on the BBC or something, and then they were transcribed, and I think his wife or somebody organized them in Mere Christian. It's a wonderful little book. I just reread it last summer. C.S. Lewis is smarter than you are. I don't care. Even you. I just, maybe not you. He's certainly smarter than me. That guy was a brilliant, widely read, articulate man. I, I, I can't tell you how, how deep he thinks. And he put together his thoughts with a logical, philosophical defense of the veracity of the Christian faith. And believe me, as a seventh grader, that blew my mind. Wow, if the faith makes sense rationally to C.S. Lewis, it's certainly good enough for me. So C.S. Lewis, that's one of the books. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Bible. The Bible's in a whole other category. But C.S. Lewis is mere Christianity. As a junior high kid, one of the books that helped me kind of push that house onto the rock a little bit. Now fast forward to the 80s, and, um, and now this very best-selling popular book by Lee Strobel came out called The Case for Christ. Any of you ever seen the movie or read the book The Case for Christ? Lee Strobel is an investigative reporter on the crime beat for the Chicago Tribune. He's an atheist. He covers crime stories. He's a good journalist, good writer, not interested in Christ. But he gets challenged, would the Christian faith, would it stand up in a court of law? If the evidence were pre presented for Jesus and against him, being the Son of God, how would the case be decided by an impartial jury? Anyway, he went on this expedition of sorts, and to his surprise and chagrin, he found out that the evidence for the resurrection and for Christ, the, the eyewitness evidence, would absolutely stand up in his world, a court of law. So I'm just going to say that was a second book that helped move me from sand to rock. C.S. Lewis gave me the philosophy background. This book gave me the evidentiary background. And then, fast forward to the early 2000s, 2007, I already mentioned Answers in Genesis. 
the book that Ken Ham had written at that time called The Answers Book. He's now done four editions of The Answers Book. We were coming home on the plane. All my staff was reading The Answers Book and going up and down the aisle going, can you believe this? There's an answer to this? What? All these questions that we thought had been settled 100% in favor of evolution, Ken had quoted all these different sciences with another explanation. Now, <coughs> I know that's controversial, and people can come down on whatever side they want to, but I had never even heard there was an auction. And now I've got philosophical evidence, testimonial evidence, and way more scientific evidence than I ever thought existed. And I will add one more to the thing that has helped move my faith from sand to rock, and that's archaeological evidence. And I've learned this from your pastor, Dr. Steve Smith. We have done work together in Israel. I've, I've maybe Judy's got, we have some bad pictures of you, but you know, I've done work, and Steve. He has taught me that one of the unique evidences of the Christian faith, up and against most other faiths, maybe all other faiths, is that the places and sites that are talked about in our Bible really exist. He's found a bunch of them. He's found mosaics. We've talked to a lot of the archaeologists in Israel who have found bulas and inscriptions. You know what that says right there, Steve? What does that say? Do you know what that is? Beit David. So in the house, English, of, house of David. I'm oh, sorry. House of who? David. And you know what that stone is called? The David Stone. Tell Dan, yes, it's from, it's from the city of Dan. Mm -hmm. I was with a prominent Israeli archaeologist, Ronnie Reich, and I'm asking him as we're, and I say, so, you know, Ronnie, do you believe that there really was a David? Is he historical or is he just metaphorical? And, ah, David, yes, David, no, David, who can tell? You know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's kind of how they go. And then they find this from 900 BC, talking about, what is it again? House of David. This is not an isolated incident, is it? You know, I'm sure that he has taught you guys well about how archaeological finds, one after the other, are just corroborating the stories of the Bible. Can that help move your faith from sand to rock? I hope so. Now, what is the end result of this? For me, how exciting is it that the Bible is more trustworthy than the newscast? It's more trustworthy... <laughs> than my college professors in religion or science. In fact, it's so trustworthy that I can actually put my whole life on it from the first page to the last page. Well, that's something that's kind of fun. That's exciting. That's not just a have to. Because here's the thing. If the Bible can be trusted in what it says about history, then why couldn't it be trusted in what it says about the future? If we found out the opposite was true. There was no flood. There was no David. Peter didn't write the book of Peter. Somebody else did and they lied. If, 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 if that's liberal theology, I have no interest in that faith. I, I would rather do just about anything else than follow a mythology or Aesop's fables. And I, I, you know, Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're not good people. We're idiots. We're the biggest. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, man, we are something else. That's what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, session. I want to tell you a, a, a quick little side trip here. When we started that business, I told you I had two employees, I had rent for the room, and I had no money. I didn't tell the employees this. Uh, and didn't really, we had some people that had said, oh, we'll, we'll continue to use you, but those people all fell through. And on the very first day we were open for business, September 1, 2001, which unfortunately was 10 days before 9-11, which took everything off the table. But on our first day of business, in our little new office with one chair and one table and an editing machine and just a lot of empty space, by the end of that day, a friend of mine had introduced me to a guy named Luke Wilson from the Institute for Religious Research, IRR. They had been looking for a production company to bring to the screen 10 years of research that he had been doing on Joseph Smith. You know who Joseph Smith is, right? The Grand Bishop of the Mormon Church. And we said we'd be happy to have that job. By the end of Monday, day one, we had a $90,000 job and a $30,000 deposit check in our hands. By the, and I had never heard of Luke Wilson the day before. That was a bit of step one confirmation, like, Lord, we stepped into the river, and then you parted the waters. Now, it wasn't just the money which allowed me to pay the people and keep the business open. The project was really interesting. Joseph Smith 
was the one who supposedly was visited by the angel Moroni and shown the golden tablets, and then he transcribed them from ancient Egyptian into English, and that becomes the Book of Mormon. And so he's running on that for a long time, and he's an interesting character if you ever want to look into him. Not all that admirable when it comes to other people's wives and other people's money, I'll just say that much. The pressure and the heat starts getting to him because of his shenanigans with other people's wives and other people's money. And one day in a town in Ohio, a traveling exhibit came through, ancient artifacts from Egypt. And this is before movie theaters and baseball teams, so this was, the, this was a big deal. A covered wagon come in, the guy sets out his whatever he had, mummies and the papyruses and this and that, and everybody from this town in, in Ohio comes by, Chandler. And uh, they call, oh, get Joseph here. This stuff, he knows how to read Egyptian. Because he claimed he translated the tablets from the angel, who then took the tablets conveniently back to heaven so none of us could see them. So they go and they fetch Joseph. Hey, what's it say? Steve just did it for you a minute ago. I pointed to that Hebraic. What did he do? He read it because he's not a phony. Joseph Smith opens this Egyptian papyrus scroll filled with writing. Has no, I'm the, My interpretation has no idea at all what it says, but needs to put on a bit of a thing. Oh, God, heaven has smiled upon us, he said. This is an ancient transcript from Abraham. And he wrote another. This is an ancient transcript from Joseph. Now, the proprietor of that little thing is going, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. We'd like to buy those because they're very valuable. Oh, yes, we must have them. How much are they? The price, you know, the guy, they're worth, you know, a couple of nickels. He charges, this is in the mid-1800s, $2,000 each. I can't tell you how much money that was, but it was everything everybody had. They had a big come to Jesus meeting. Everyone put all their savings in the pot. Michael Chandler drove away with the pot, and they left Joseph with these two papyrus scrolls, anxious to find out what Abraham had to say and what Joseph had to say. So Joseph Smith goes to work, thinking, I better do this. But this time, he has absolutely no idea what he's doing. He had as much chance of translating that as you or I would, Okay, well, there's a little diamond here, and there's a diamond here. So that must be uh, A, no an E, no an O. And he, he, he goes nowhere, can't get anywhere, sort of lets time pass and kind of puts these things aside and just tries to let the hoopla go. Now, people had spent their life savings. They get so mad at him, they drive him out of this Ohio town, mad. And he goes up to Nauvoo in Illinois and establishes another beachhead of modern-day Mormonism. That goes away well for a while, but he starts to get low on cash, and one weekend in a flurry of activity, he translates them both. Translates them both. If we went down to the religious bookstore in Indianapolis, we could buy the Mormon Bible today, and you could open it, and you could open it to the Book of Abraham. It's still in there. And what was at the top of this scroll that he had actually bought, what well, the people had bought, was a hieroglyph, a, a painting, you know, a drawing of... I have one of these in my office because I got it when I was in Sinai, and it's a, it's a, you know, you see Horus and you see Osiris and you see Amun Ra. You know, these are these Egyptian gods. You've seen pictures like this. Most of us have, but this one was ripped. <coughs> this one was ripped. So, in the picture, you saw the the feet, but you you couldn't see the heads. So Joseph, in his inspiration and stupidity, drew them in. Now imagine, I'm going to use the old comic book. Some of you might not remember Peanuts, but I remember Charles Schultz's Peanuts. If you showed me a comic strip of Peanuts and you ripped the heads off, and on the head of Snoopy, I drew the face of a Great Dane, and on the head of Linus, I you know, put a guy wearing a baseball cap or whatever, all of you would go, this guy, has no, this guy doesn't know Peanuts. I mean, Snoopy's a beagle. Everyone knows that. Linus is a boy. Well, at that time, no one had anything to reference Joseph Smith to, so he got away with it temporarily, and then he was killed by a bunch of angry husbands, not surprisingly, murdered in jail. His wife, who wanted nothing to do with him, sold everything he had. I mean, it's a bad ending to the story. She sold those papyruses to uh, the Chicago Museum, and shortly after that, Chicago Museum burned with the rest of the city in 1872. Good news for the Mormon church, because you would not want those things coming out. Well, guess what? They, they didn't burn. And they, uh, they, they surfaced for about a day at uh, New York, and, uh, and there were journalists in about the turn of the century, 1900, who saw them. By then, 
we could read a little bit of Egyptian, and there was some questioning, and then they disappeared again until the 1960s. This is a long story, I'm sorry. But in the 1960s, it turns out an, a guy from the University of Utah was in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has a huge Egyptology section. He's going through, going through, and he comes across in one of the files something that looks familiar. Looks familiar because he'd seen it in the printed Book of Mormon, in the Book of Abraham. He recognizes that pictographic picture. And he puts two and two together, and he's found those original two scrolls that Joseph had said he'd translated. Which, and so it came out, it took less than a day for the Mormon church to buy them and lock them up. Ten years of research from my friend at the time from the Institute for R Religious Research, he had found full-scale photographic, museum-quality photographs of those scrolls taken from an insider who worked high up in the Mormon church whose faith was not built on rock. He had a great job. His wife has died in the world. There's a lot of wonderful Mormons and a lot of great things to do about it. I mean, not that they have some great family stuff, their mission program. I mean, I don't want to trash them. But this guy's job on the high floor, high paying job was translating into other languages. And he kept coming across anomalies. Like Joseph would not know the difference between the tabernacle and the temple. Well, that didn't make any sense. And he's going across, and he starts to one by one realize that this stuff doesn't add up. His faith was built on Joseph Smith, which is, I'm telling you, it's sand. And he said to me, the first thing that came across my mind was, I'm going to lose my wife. I don't know how to handle this. So he just decided he wouldn't give his wife his conclusions. He just showed her the same things he was looking at. We then, in this documentary, this job I got on day one, we took those photographs, and they were big, to two of the leading Egyptologists in the country. One was at Brown University, decidedly a non-Christian school. One was at the University of Chicago. So neither of these Egyptologists had anything kind to say about Jesus, but they told him what they really said. Now we can find out once and for all, is this really the testimony of Abraham? <laughs> is this really the work of Joseph? No. There's not a single word. It's a funerary. It's kind of like the phone book. It's like the funerary document. There been, I mean... Not a single word is right. The Mormon church ignored many requests that we made to them to go on record and answer this charge. To me, this is what, Steve, we would call a smoking gun. Now, again, people don't need to be judged by one time, and I don't want to make a big accusation here, but here's the thing. If Joseph Smith cannot be trusted, and the one thing that we could test his interpretation on, how can we trust that he translated these golden tablets that we can't test him? That's a fair question to ask a rational person. I do not know how very rational people in the world ha have that question unanswered. The same is true of the Bible, except the opposite happens. It stands up time after time. So, did you put up, I want to show you the picture of Dunluce Castle. I was asked to speak to a graduating class this year of uh, graduate students at a film school, a film school that I went to, Compass Arts. There's a virtual graduation, and I happen to be in Northern Ireland. Uh, Gwen, you mentioned uh, In Christ Alone this morning. That's written by Keith and Kristen Getty, and we were filming a music video with Keith and Kristen Getty, who live in Northern Ireland, and we had to quarantine for a while, and it was really one, they were great, great people. And So we came across this castle, and I'm like, that is cool. Everyone loves ancient castles on the northern coast of Northern Ireland. So I filmed my little graduation speech in front of that, with that behind me. And I said to the group what I just said to you, that these three books had made a difference, and one of them was Mere Christianity. And by the way, C.S. Lewis used this castle as his model in his mind for what he called Care Paravel, which is the castle that's in, in, in the Narnia stories. C.S. Lewis's story is fiction, but he drew his inspiration from Care Paravel. We have had um, now a chance to travel to other places, to learn from other people, and to tell stories of Christians who now have built their house on such solid rock that it has withstood every storm. And I want to show you, just as I kind of close here, uh, a quick clip, just a trailer, I think, from the movie that we just recently completed about Richard and Sabina Warmbrand and their, and their transformation from atheists, hedonists, Actually, you know, what it is is Sabina goes, she falls in love first with Richard, and then through him, eventually, kicking and screaming, she falls in love with God, and then the highest level is she learns how to love her enemies. 
So if you would just show that quick clip and then I'll wrap it up. I want the same things every girl wants. And then a little bit more. I want you to meet some more. Oh. Is every bit as ambitious as you? <laughs> Who's this? She is my niece, Sabina Oser. My mother is nagging me to get married. She's even picked out a girl. That sounds very nice for you. And what do you think? I think my mother should ask me that question. Your mother's gonna kill me. can be looking for you today. I'm not hiding. And you should. Uh, since he's been up on bond? We can get you to the border if we leave now. You know this is ridiculous. I'm collecting all the verses in the Bible that tell us not to be afraid. I think I might need to lean on all of them. If we stay... I'll follow the others into prison. It will be the end of our life together. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We believe this or we don't. I think we have to stay. We have a job to do. encouraged deeply by the life of Richard and Sabina, the real Richard and Sabina. I love working with the actors, I love making this film, and it was a great blessing as a filmmaker, but just as a human being, to realize that there is a faith so deep where he says, there are 365 verses in the Bible that tell us not to fear. I might need to lean on all of them. We could have authentic fear but we can have an even deeper faith. So do we, do I? I go back to that question. If Peter says, be prepared to anyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that's in you, the first question is, is there hope in you? Do I have a heart with smile lines or am I fearful? And I want to ask you that question today. This is not about your head. I know you believe the right things. I know you are taught from the Bible at this church. I know this church goes back to the 1840s. We stand on the shoulders of people of faith here. But ask yourself, do I have hope in my heart? Because if you do, where could that possibly have come from? Do you think that that hope in your heart could come from the world? So this is the proof this is the best proof I can offer you. That if you say, am I basically hopeful? In the Heidelberg Catechism says, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. If that hope is in your heart, only you know it. And if it is, there is your proof, your evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Because that could not have come through your eyes and ears any more than Peter's a answer to Jesus. You're the Son of God. You're the living Christ. You're the Messiah. That didn't come to you from flesh and blood. That came to you from the Father. I don't want to be shallow and pretend there's not problems in the world. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in our next session when I talk about you. But I just am going to go back to me. I am not trying to be arrogant. I'm thankful God has put hope in my heart. And I hope you are too. Let's just sing a song and as we sing this song pastor's going to come up and pray with anybody who wants to come forward and do that kind of examination. Examine your heart. The rest of us let's just stand and sing this. Oh, 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, holy, holy Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 see you high and lifted up, shining in glory pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 we sing holy 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 I want to see We're going to take a short break. Great morning. Thank you so much that John and Judy can be with us and the experiences they bring and the, the worldview they bring to us, God, that we don't understand. <clears throat> Help us, God, to understand that we are privileged. We are blessed. You've given us freedoms in our country that we, we don't even appreciate, God. We have a hard time appreciating because we don't know what it's like to live under persecution, the threat of death if we even look at a Bible or mention your name at all. But God, persecutions come in this direction. And God, help us to realize we're in a spiritual battle. We need our hope, our faith to be strong in you. Because the battle's going to come. It's a real battle. It's a spiritual battle. And we win it only, God, when we're strong in our faith in you. God bless this next session, this next hour together. And uh, pray, God, you'll speak to our hearts again. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>